It's another beautiful day in God's neighborhood, and the rain is cleansing. It's filling. It's refreshing. It's anointing. We want the rain of glory to fall consistently. That means we got to be positioned. Amen? And amen. Is everybody here today? Is everybody okay? Are you awake? Praise God. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And in his presence is fullness of joy. Did you drink this morning? Are you refreshed or refreshed? <laughs> First Timothy 4. Let's get right to it. We got work to do. Glory, glory. First Timothy chapter 4. In verse 1, is everybody there? Let's speak it together. Now the Spirit expressly says, is everybody there? Now the Spirit does what? Expressly says, that means I got, I want your attention. That in the latter times, or we're in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, which is extremely manifesting right now globally. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Those are individuals that cannot receive correction. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Forbidding to marry. In other words, marrying according to the ways of God. Amen. Now they're approving any other marriage. So in this, he says, in the latter days, a high level of influence will penetrate the earth. A high level of influence will penetrate the earth with deception, lust, false religion, and doctrines of demons. This would invade societies, influential positions, social media, education, Movies, music, the movie industry, and internet industries, as well as political and governmental. And we have seen this happen continuously, and it is rising. Does everybody understand that? The purpose is to turn mankind away from Christ Jesus, the truth, by imposing a rebellious and disobedient spirit of influence. What's their purpose? It is to turn mankind away from Christ Jesus and the truth by imposing a rebellious or rebellious and disobedient spirits of influence. That's what they're trying to do. That's why they're infiltrating so that mankind becomes rebellious and disobedient to the ways of God. And 2 Corinthians chapter 6, if you'll turn there. Second Corinthians chapter six. So God, I want to share with you that this invasion has been going on for decades. We've come to its climax because right now the body of Christ is standing up and resisting and exposing. It's about time. But this also has invaded the body of Christ. This rebellious and disobedient spirits. It's a promotion of selfishness. It's a promotion of self. It's a promotion of self-imposed religion, which we've talked about before. It's all about me, myself, and I. And 2 Corinthians 6, 11, Old Corinthians 
We have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. They are restricted by their own emotional belief systems. Now in return, for some I speak as to children, you also be open. Do not be unevenly yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? I, I'm telling you, I, believers still don't get this. And the reason is because they're not real believers. Because the word believe means to follow. See, so people are still living according to they want, associating, associating with those that they want, instead of what God wants. And it's got to change. Because many people are missing what God's trying to do. They're missing their healings. They're missing their blessings. They're missing all kinds of things that God is trying to do in their life. See, because they believe that they're doing the right thing. You may be doing the good thing, but are you doing the will thing? His will. So he warns us. And he's verse 15, he says, What accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Just because they say they're believers doesn't mean they're believers. Amen? Just because someone says they believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but they're still doing the things that are not according to the will of God, that makes them a non-believer and a liar. And it says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? So what's he trying to do? He's trying to expose these things so we come out of them and not be so influenced by this invasion of demonic forces because that's what's happening. And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, I'll walk among them, I'll be their God, and they'll be my people if they do something. There is a condition. If you do what? Come out from among this belief system. And be separate, says the Lord. And don't touch what is unclean. That means do not agree with it. And then I will receive you. And I'll hide you in the secret place. I will be a father to you. And you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. Therefore, is everybody there? Having these promises. These are promises of God. Beloved, let us what? Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear, reverence, and honor and respect to God Almighty of what he is requiring. See, individuals are restricted by their own emotional belief systems incorporated through the high level of secular influence, which has been penetrated by the demonic forces. It causes disobedience to their call, their purpose, and their destiny. Does everybody get it? And hope of departing by recognizing these influences, <laughs> we must examine our own motives, attitudes, and desires. And this is what the enemy doesn't want us to do. He wants to keep our mind busy so we don't look at these things. So God is trying to bring us to this place where we are departing from this influence, recognizing this influence, and examining our own attitude because it's influencing it. These influence, these demonic forces influence your attitude, your motive, and your desires. And God is hoping and trying to get our attention so that we turn from these things and recognize these things and begin to, uh, a process of perfecting obedience. And that is so that you and I thrive for first-time obedience, which is called the master's level. Everyone say first-time obedience. 
That's called perfect obedience. Does everybody get it? James chapter 1. So we, there should be a desire to reach the master's level of perfecting obedience. Perfect obedience. Aren't you glad you came today? James chapter 1. In verse 2, we've heard this scripture many times. What does it say? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Didn't say if, says when. Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces Patience. In other words, he is going to test how much you're connected to him. And this faith is going to produce endurance. Why? Because you're connected to the presence of God. It's going to produce an endurance where no man can endure compared to the anointing in Christ Jesus. But let patience... Have its perfect work. There is a perfect work. In other words, this is going to take training. It's going to take trials. It's going to take pruning. This patience. So that when you and I are asked something to do, it's first time obedience. It's not why, if, when, how. Does somebody get it? It's yes, Lord. Yes. And if you can't do it in front with man, you certainly can't do it with God. But let patience have its perfect work. It's a perfect work. It's a training that you may be what? Come on, read it with me. That you may be what? Perfect in what? Complete in what? Lacking nothing. Lacking nothing. We should be lacking nothing. I don't lack anything. In fact, I have life and life abundantly. And it just keeps coming. It just keeps overflowing. God is overflowing. But there's an area, he says, I've come to bring you life and life abundantly. Amen? Well, there's an area then that you and I must become perfect in obedience. It's called first-time obedience. You know, as a child is being trained up, you know, you may have to tell that child multiple times. But your heart's desire is that after a period of time, there's first-time obedience. So you have to keep repeating yourself. <laughs> he says, now look, at if you lack this, then you lack wisdom. And you're not connected to the wisdom above. You're connected to the wisdom beneath because that's what brings disobedience. It is secular. It's not eternal. And if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and will be given to him. But let him ask in what? Faith, knowing that God will give. With no doubting, doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And let not that person suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Why? Because he's double-minded, unstable in all his ways. Double-minded and unstable. That's what an individual is who is not first-time obedient. They are double-minded and unstable. Why? Because that's how God sees it. He says, I can't trust them. I can't trust them. Yes, I know that you say you love me. I know that you want to do the right thing. I know, but you haven't been trained enough yet. You haven't submitted yet. What does the word say? Submit to God and then what? Resist the devil. You're still associating with things. You're still grumbling. You're complaining. You're still trying to figure it out instead of trusting me. 
Ooh. Again, this will take training, trials, pruning, and patience. You will have many no's from God. And you will have many waits from him until first-time obedience is established. Without any reasoning, amen, without questions, without delays, when he speaks, we obey. That's called perfect obedience. It's not ifs and buts. Again, he will put you under a place of a, with someone over authority over us, and this is how he checks us. Does everybody understand that? Because if you can't be first-time obedient there, you know, he knows you can't be first-time obedient with him. It's impossible. Hebrews 5. There are things when God is about to do something with someone and then they fall short. They're no longer obedient. They're no longer consistent. And he changes plans. But Lord, you said, no, not anymore. It's been changed. Why? Because you haven't been consistent. You haven't been obedient. I, you started to earn my trust. I was going to bless you. Now you've lost my trust in this area. Now I've got to hold something back. Hebrew, chapter 5, verse 5. Let's speak it. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, you are my son today, I have begotten you. As he always says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. He was heard because of what? So let me ask you this. Is godly fear first term obedience? Yes. So God heard. You know, many people are waiting on God for an answer. And he's waiting on us to get, for us to give him an answer in the area of first time obedience. Though he was a son, yet he learned what? Verse 8. Though he was a son, yet he learned what? Obedience by the things which he what? Suffered. That's why we go through trials and tribulations. It's called suffering. But it's called training. Why? Because he, he's trying to get us to that place again where he says, why are you still associating with people I told you not to? Why are you still going to those places? Why are you still hearing that music? Why are you still watching this movie? Why are you still doing these same things that I told you not to? Why are you putting other things before me? Which you know you're not supposed to. Why are you trusting in man and not trusting in me? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why are you working all those hours instead of getting in my presence? That means you've put others first before me. Why are you not assembling? All of these areas that he looks at. See, people don't look at it. It's the little things that leaven the whole lump. It's the little things. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's go a little further. I believe. And verse um, 9. And having been what? Perfected. He became the author of eternal salvation to all who what? Obey him. To all who what? Obey him. Let me salvation is granted to those who obey. <laughs> Called out by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become what? Dull of hearing. So when a person is not first-time obedience, they are dull of hearing. They fall into a religious state of mindset instead of an obedience. See, because obedience is relationship. For though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you again the first principles or first-time obedience. 
of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. I'm telling you, people have gone from eating milk back to, I mean, eating meat back to eating milk, drinking milk. They have backslidden spiritually, where they have to start all over again. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to what? discern, discern both good and evil. So they have come to a place because they have the wisdom of God to see things through because of first time obedience, they're able to discern. And that's what you and I must do is discern what is the influence? Who told you that? Who is the leading voice of your house and your temple? Obedience is learned by suffering. It's learned by trials. It's learned by no's. <laughs> Anyone ever tell you no? You ever tell a kid no? No, you can't have that. I mean, a little child, you know. Sometimes they go into tantrums. Did you ever see a child in a store go bonkers? <laughs> I see adults do the same thing. <laughs> Grumble, complain, argue, and everything else. It's like they, they, sh they earned the Binky Award, you know? <laughs> What's God trying to do? Get us to a place to become perfect in obedience by first-time obedience in Christ Jesus. In other words, we got to be consistent. Consistent in that. You know, people do things for the wrong reason. Everything you and I do should always be first is what I'm doing pleasing you, Lord. Amen. Amen? What am I doing is pleasing you. Even if somebody's asking you for help for something, amen? You better make sure that that help is directed, that you're getting approval from the Lord to help that person. Because sometimes God is saying No. Even the word says, don't pray for a certain person. Why? Because they're in the hands of God. Sometimes, sometimes people go to drug programs because they want to get restored back to their families. That's the wrong reason. Because there's still a danger to their families until they're freed, filled, anointed, and empowered. So they're no longer living a life of demon management. And living a life of first-time obedience. For uh, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Is everybody okay? Everyone say practice, practice. makes perfect. Makes perfect. <laughs> Romans 1, verse 1. Let's speak it. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience. Grace and apostleship for what? Obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. In other words, there's obedience to maintaining first-time connection. Amen? Obedience to the faith. Obedience to his connection with God. Among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. Again, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be what? Saints. 
Obedience to the faith, consistency, the connection of God's presence, truth, and power. Listen, if you're not connected, it's impossible to be first-time obedient. And one of the things the enemy do will try and sever your connection. You know, just like if you're on a phone and, and, and you, you can sense the connection getting weak, and it, <laughs> it's the same thing. That's how people's connection can get. It's either a solid connection or it's not. There isn't really no in-between. In 2 Corinthians 10, Second Corinthians chapter 10. In verse 4. Hallelujah. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down what? Strongholds. A stronghold is a memory lie. Casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience. Now, bring it according to the obedience of Christ. So you're going to line it up to what God says. Now he says, in being ready to punish all disobedience, when what? When your obedience is fulfilled. So if you're not a first-time obedient individual, how can you have dominion over other things? You can't. That's an open door to the enemy. Being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. No victory over influence of thought. Not able to break loose from mind control invoked by secularism. Because of the lack of first-time obedience. Why ask me to do this? Have someone else. That's not first-time obedience. <laughs> when asked to do things, compromise. Don't go all the way through. Don't do it 100%. You do it half butt. It brings mistrust to God. Procrastination. Grumbling. Complaining. Again, compromising. How about reasoning? All of these things. He's saying, why don't you just do it and trust me? Why do you hesitate? Why do you buck? You know, we have a teaching called Stop Bucking. Now, start bowing and stop bucking, something like that. First John chapter 4. Now, again, I want to reemphasize these are the things because of this influence affect our, your, our attitude, motive, and desires. Then people are asking God to fulfill their desires, and he said, that's not even for me. First John chapter 4. <laughs> Glory. Verse 16. Is everybody there? First John 4, 16, and we know, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is what? Love. And he who ab abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been what? Perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Was Jesus' first time obedient? Yeah. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out what? Fear. 
because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first what? Loved us. This is powerful. So perfect love is perfect obedience. Why? Because he says, if you love me, you'll obey me. That breaks down the barrier of fear. He says, again, if you love me, you'll obey me. So first time obedience is perfect love. That breaks down fear. First Corinthians 13. What is love? We know love is God. But there is a fruit of love also. 1 Corinthians 13, he explains what love is. Verse 8. Oh, hallelujah. What does it say? Love what? It never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there's tongues, they will cease. Whether there's knowledge, it will vanish away. Why? Because it's going to all come to an end. When Jesus takes over this earth, we won't need it anymore. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. When that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I what? Spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away what? Childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And abide, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is, is love. Again, in this perfect love, is first obedience, which is perfect obedience. Amen? Philippians 2. Yeah. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 2. Where are you, Philip? Oh, happy day. Yo. Philippians 2.12. And speak it therefore, my beloved, as you have always what? As you have always obeyed. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my... Oh, hallelujah, what people do when the pastor's not around. Oh, what people do when their boss is not around. Oh, what people do when people aren't around. Work out your what? Work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may be become blameless and harmless children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Wow. Do all things without complaining. Maintain first time obedience to its perfecting of your union with the divine nature that assists you with the union of the divine nature. Does everybody get it? Because the old nature is rebellious. Your human nature is rebellious. So in this, by being a first-time obedient, you are crushing the old man. And in that, you are now unifying and walking in unity and merging and, and joining and blending into the divine nature of God then he begins a battle for you. Go to Philippians 4, since we're here. And verse 4.
4, 4, it says what? Rejoice in the Lord when? When I feel like it? When you're miserable? When you get blessed? When somebody rebukes you? Always. Rejoice when? In the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice and let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. What about when somebody offends you? <laughs> yeah, get rid of it. Rejoice. Praise God. Eh, that person's a moron. <laughs> Praise God. And forgive him. And bless him. Even if he's a moron. <laughs> then it says in verse 6, here's something. Are you ready? Okay, verse 5 says, Let your gentleness be known to all men that the Lord is where? At hand. That means you're in relationship. Then it says, be anxious for everything, right? Be anxious for nothing. Nothing. See, people that are anxious for everything are distant from first-time obedience. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Wow. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, report if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Focus on these things. Amen. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Wow. Wow. I'm going to close at 1 Peter chapter 4. Anxiousness is called fear. It is a protector of the old nature, and it is a protector of pride, and it is a promoter of rebellion. Hello? And disobedience to God. 1 Peter 4, 7. Praise be to God. Let's speak it together. Is everybody there? But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be what? Serious. And watchful in your prayer. See, people don't take this serious enough. You know what? Because of the doctrine that says God forgives you. Amen. Which he does. Thank God. But people are not serious enough. They take it nonchalantly. Do you know that if you don't have true forgiveness in your heart, you are not forgiven. Amen? So if you're repeating the same thing over and over and over, we will even ask for forgiveness. Because re true repentance is to turn away, hasn't it? So when you have true repentance in your heart, you turn away from it. That means you're going to go on another course that's going to say, okay, I'm going to do this right. Because without true repentance, there isn't true forgiveness. Does everybody understand that? That means you got to forgive others also. And it doesn't mean you got to feel like it. You have to make the choice to do it. And then you got to turn your own hardened heart and offenses and pains over to the Lord. Because where there's criticism, there's unforgiveness. Does everybody get it? Oh, hallelujah. We can go on forever just on that. But let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 4. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, let's start at verse 7 again. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For the love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without what? Grumbling. 
As each one has received a gift, minister to one another as a good steward of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak according to the oracles and righteousness of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies in the spirit, not in the flesh, and that in all things God may be what? Glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery dart or fiery trials, which is to what? Try you. Train you. Train you. Your trials are for what? Training. It's going to train you. It's going to test you. God's going to find out where you're at. He already knows where you're at. Believe me, he's going to try and make it so that you know where you're at. Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice in to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when he is, his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. And on their part, he is blaspheming. But on your part, he's what? Glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a busybody in other people's matters, disobedient or rebellious, grumbling or a complainer. Hello, we can go on with that. And if anyone suffers as a Christian, that's, see, there's a difference between suffering as a Christian and suffering of the flesh. If anyone is a Christian let, and he suffers, let him not be ashamed, but let him be glorified in this matter and glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. That's what's happening. And it begins with us first. What will the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God, that's according to the will of God, not the disobedience to God. Amen? If somebody asks you to go paint a door and you decide to paint all four doors, that's disobedience. Somebody get that? <laughs> Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as the faithful, as to a faithful what? Creator. Praise God. Perfecting obedience. Why? Because of this tremendous demonic influence that has infiltrated and penetrated and invaded not only the earth, people's homes, their minds, their souls, their will. See, people think that you approve of something then when you're not supposed to. Amen? That's why he says, come out from among them. Why? Then if you're not coming out from among them, you're approving of them. And then you're interfering with what God is trying to do with them. Oh, Hallelujah. Perfecting obedience. We want to reach the master's level in first time obedience, which is the perfection of obedience. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. And we take this opportunity to repent of every area, Lord, we have manipulated, exaggerated, not willing to listen, and refuse to be first time obedient. We repent and ask for your forgiveness, mercies, and grace. Please wash us with the blood of Christ. Heal us with the stripes of Jesus. And empower us that we may hear and obey to be first-time obedient servants of the Most High God. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.